idea for all this really came from a dream? Yes, it did. Good evening and welcome to Nox Mente. Tonight's guest is Patrick Fox. Patrick is considered an expert on the art and art scene of the 1980s, as well as an exp expert leading in the life and work of both Rene Ricard and Edith Diak. Is that right? How to say it? That's correct. Thank you. He's written about both, both written about both for the magazine Let's Panic. Patrick co-directed and co-edited Edith Diak's first installation of her Super 8 film cycle, Beyond Genre, which is her representative which, as her representative, Patrick shepherded with the Museum of Modern Art and is now part of the permanent film collection. He's working on the next four films of the cycle for MoMA and is uh, working to place the ex ar archive with the museum. He has loaned paintings from his collection to museums around the world and has either donated or loaned to both MoMA and the Guggenheim Museum. Patrick, welcome to the show. Hi. Welcome, Patrick. I'm so glad Good. to have you. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> this is a, this is this is a this is a this is a this is very I'm very excited about this. I'm yeah, I to, I am too. I'm and to show, and I'm I'm honored that you invited me. Thank you. Yes, I'm. I, I've hesitated to invite you because it seems like every time I have a friend on, we get into our kiki in and. <laughs> You know, so, but I've known you forever and a day, and I just adore you. I've always adored you. And so I just want to, I'm going to do a little gushing on you. I told you this already because you're, you really are humble and a dear sweetie, but I mean, and for gush people that, and, gu and gush of all. <laughs> so for people that may not know, you've just been involved in, and people that don't really understand the influence New York City and Manhattan has over the world, and, and a lot of people don't realize how it trickles. Uh, mm -hmm. You've just been in the thick of it, you know, from uh, uh, every, everything in the late 70s and through the 80s. Uh, from Cookie Mueller to, I mean, just everyone, everything that's gone on. And people don't understand how how all that sets the standards for, for all kinds of stuff that happens in pop culture. And, uh, and there's a lot. And then also they don't understand that you just get top names, right? And so you don't understand how big the big and small the scene is all at the same time. And that there's just a lot of players and you have certainly been one of the players. Uh, and as I've been, a, I've been on the fringe of major player, I've been like you know sort of. I, I've been, I've been in the dabbed, scene. I, I've I've been in the scene, but, but you know like I haven't. Um, anyway, yes. yes well, I, this I, is why I love you. I mean, this is you're humble. You're not. You know, you're not Mister Throw It All Around. But you have been in the thick of, it, <laughs> you know, in several ways, and and just that you're getting uh, recognized for stuff concerning Rene Ricard and your art collection, you know, just all of this stuff is wonderful to see happening now. So I'm glad that, that you are seeing some, uh, some airtime in that regard, because you've certainly been there. So with that you. said, you know, give us, so you, you said you brought in immediately before we get into kind of you, uh, you said you brought in a poem of Rene Ricard, and also give people a hint of who Rene Ricard is for those that may not know. Rene um, was ha, had a lot of best friends, and I was lucky enough to be one of them. And he was a poet first and foremost. He was an art critic and a painter. Rene um, first po book of poetry was published by the Dia Foundation. Um, and uh, is considered, uh, you know, they, it's known to his friends as the Tiffany book because of his fondness for Tiffany catalog blue and um, which the little paperback, uh, which originally I believe sold for $10 at the, uh, um, 
and so I have, you know, I have a, I have a few copies which Renee has, in, you know, one time somebody stole my copy, and then Renee uh, 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 crossed my name out in the dedication and donated, gave it to somebody else, and then I found it at their house, and I was like, oh, that's mine. There's my drawing of me by Renee, and then uh, I, so I have. Anyway, I have several copies, and then finally, um, the last year the poems were the first book of poetry was uh, translated into the French, and um, so uh, because we're talking about dreams, I thought I would read um, a very short poem that Rene wrote, and it's from uh, his book of poetry, uh, Rene Ricard, 1979, 1980. Uh, it's still available at Printed Matter. The last thing to do before you wake up is to go to sleep. So do your dreams a favor and wake up to make up. Let your makeup interpret your dreams. Oh, I love the <laughs> genius. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. And I, you know, um, I showed Renee's paintings at my gallery in New York in the uh, in about '85 or '6, and it was a bit of a scandal. Um, he did these paintings. I was working with two artists who lived in the past, David McDermott and Peter McGough, and um, uh, Peter, uh, David, and Peter came in with a shadow box uh, with a, a, an Edwardian. Uh, they, you know, they would paint in the style of, of specific periods of art history. And so they did this head of Jesus, um, sort of like an icon. And um, uh, uh, they, they were working with uh, an, an art consultant whose name was, is Diego Cortez. He's very smart, very dear friend, and I adore him. And he suggested they put this uh, Edwardian style uh, icon of head of Jesus in a modern shadow box. So it was very expensive to put in a shadow box. Oh no, Patrick, are you there? <laughs> I think we lost Patrick again. Everyone is in New York. He's got that New York City internet. <laughs> yeah, I know. Everyone is uh, using the internet in New York City right now, in Manhattan. Let's see. We lost you. He'll be back. Yeah. Uh-oh. You're back. You're, you're back. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there were, there were paintings called uh, that, that Renee did in various styles of on found paintings. And he, and he signed them McDermott McGough Cortez on the front. And some of them were god awful and some of them were quite charming. And um, David and Peter saw the paintings and uh, infuriated left my gallery after I gave them a large sum of cash and um, to, to work on a project. And uh, we didn't speak for years. And it's in Peter's new book, which I should plug, but I'm not going to. Oh, oh! <laughs> you, you're welcome to at that point in the show, though. <laughs> no, Peter. Peter has written a, uh, some sort of memoir, which I have but have not read yet. I'm referred to it as the hottest gallery in New York, and uh, but not by name. And so, uh, you know, uh, you know, I wish him well, and I'm sure he does the same for me. And. Uh, but at some point, I'll read the book. I just haven't yet. But I do know yeah. he refers to me as the hottest gallery in New York. <laughs> I was, you know, Patrick, before we get into the into the, the Knox Montage part of the show, I had was stumbling around on cable, and I saw all of a sudden, I, I like these Hollywood bios, and I saw that um, Renee was featured heavily in the Basquiat one, and... Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I think, wasn't I talking to you? Weren't you involved with that? In, uh, in, I was, oh. In well, the film. There, in Julian's film. 
Um, yes, yes. Yes, in, in the film Basquiat, um, uh, I was visiting New York uh, when Julian was, um, when Julian was doing the script. And so he gave me a copy of the script and didn't, you know, I, I didn't, at the time I thought it was okay. And you know, my friend Michael Holman wrote it with, Ju with Julian. And um, I thought, um, you know, I read it. And then the only th thing that was wrong was uh, he had at the end of the thing, it said Jean-Michel Basquiat, 1961 to 1980, whatever year he died, nine or eight or 90, whatever year it was. And um, I said, well, you know, it's, it's wrong because uh, the first thing that John Michelle and I had in common was we were both born in 1960 and we, you know, we uh, saw that as somehow significant. And uh, so I know that for a fact, you know, uh, yeah. that was well, the year we were yeah. And, um, <laughs> and yes. <laughs> And uh, uh, I love Jean Michel, and um, he, uh, you know, Julian was like, no, no, that's it's right. You're his his father saw it, and uh, you know, different. And uh, so, but I do like that. I do like the movie now more than I did when I when I saw it when it came out. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought originally I thought we we sort of looked like dummies. I apologize to everyone. My dryer downstairs is crazy. I enjoyed it, Patrick. And uh, I mean, you know, it's it's gl glossed up and glammed up, but I, I did enjoy it. And it it's nice to see him, his name surfacing around now. It, you know, this is why I was in the intro. Like a lot of stuff just stays so in New York or, you know, and in London and Paris, like in these, the key cities. And so it's nice when it starts to echo out. And so I was happy to see Rene Ricard's name echoing out in a way that, that mo more people are exposed to all this. You know what I'm saying? I missed a whole bunch of it because you said it was. Oh no! Did I robot? Is that what? No, you didn't. He did, and then dropped out. Oh, Patrick, I think that's on your end. Yeah. So what do I do for that? I don't. Are you on a Mac? I am. Close all your applications except Zoom. Close all my applications except Zoom. I feel like other windows open. Oh, I, I have many windows open. Yeah, cl uh, close us. You're kid oh, well, I can open them later, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, okay. does a headset uh, work also? I don't yes, know. If my I, headset's good. I'm not sure if that'll help. Okay. okay that's closed. Oh. And let's see, do I have more? We it's not Knox Mente without some technical difficulties. Oh yay. So I'm glad <laughs> I can provide. <laughs> so let's get right. Uh, I want to get into your okay. We're gonna get into your bio. Let's just get into that. So and this is the I mean your this is the Knox Mente stuff now. So we're gonna go into dreams and all this. So we I always set a foundation for a person and uh so bring us back to your earliest memories of in this life and the stuff that influenced you and, you know, like pop culture, cartoons, whatever it was that you can, you can pull up that are very far back as a little kid. And also, did you have a relationship with nature? Um, no, I didn't really have a, a relationship with nature ever in my life. <laughs> it's, it's so um, urban jungle <laughs> you know we refer to it as nature and um, <laughs> um oh, my earliest memory my earliest memory that uh, i have is um sticking my tongue into the crosshatch of my uh the nipple on my bottle and pinching the tip of my tongue on the little x that's my that's my early, like one of my earliest memories. 
That's crazy. I love that, by the way. And no one's brought anything like that to the table. <laughs> that's a good one, Patrick. I think that's my that's my earliest memory. Uh, I have a few other early memories. One is having very like baby size hands, and um, uh, uh, having a sort of a crib thing, and it had a nylon mesh, and my fingers would fit perfectly into the mesh, and. Uh, um, I found out much later in life when I was about 50 years old that um, my brother, who's now in, um, who's in, who's, who's in a, a Brooklyn hospital, he Patrick, you've dropped out. Hello, Patrick. Let's see. Sorry, everyone. It is, it's one of those technical days. I was having trouble listening to live streams earlier. So I'm going to send them a text. Uh, and I noticed this on three or four live streams earlier that the, there were technical, like glitching and strobing so and patrick's dropped out and jerry has dropped out as well so it's just me on air with everyone right now so it's an intimate one on whoever's in the chat <laughs> and now patrick and jerry are back in oh, hi hi patrick jerry dropped hi. out too oh good <laughs> <laughs> this is one for the books already. So, so your fingers were in the oh, mesh. So, 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 so my brother, who um, my half brother, yes, um, when I was about fifty years old, um, told me, "Oh, I remember when they got you back." And I said, "What do you mean?" And he said, "Well, you know, when they when 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 they got you back." And I said, "Well, where was I?" And he didn't know. And so I started asking my family where I was. And apparently for the first year of my life, I was in an orphanage. And um, <laughs> they got me back. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I think I didn't and, know this. But that is so crazy. Well, I, no, I found out I, was, uh, I had a different father. But I didn't know that I was actually in an orphanage. And, um until I was about 50. And so maybe you and I, uh, maybe, I maybe I told you. Uh, I think you told me that but, real recently, like in the yeah. last couple of years. Yeah, because right. I, and, well, you certainly didn't tell me it in the past uh, right. because you didn't know. I didn't know. And, and so, uh, so that was, a, you know, I found the orphanage and all of that kind of thing, which was just completely mind blowing. And um, so, so, you know, another, you know, I get these sometimes a flash of memory comes back. And I, and so I remember once um, uh, about the same time that uh, I was putting my tongue in the nipple of the bottle uh, that uh, my parents were with uh, my father's oldest child from his first marriage. And he was a late creepy teenager. And um, he and my father were tossing me back and forth across this small room, and I believe it was Fort Lee, New Jersey. And um, uh, uh, my father caught me, and I was an infant, and he, and he gave me like a, uh, what do they call it? Like a whisker burn on my face. And I screamed, blood curdling, uh, you know, 10 month old or something or 11 month old uh, pain. And um, I remember my mother coming in and taking me and I remember like understanding the words that she was saying, like never do that, you know, never do that. And, and just before that, my father was showing me a map of California, the, of the United States of California over here on the left. And, you know, we're going to move to California. Of course, we never did. And, um, but, like, you know, that was, like, all in one night. And I think, God forbid, but I think that was at night. 
they got me back, which is a, a weird, you know, thing it's, to know. Yeah. So I have other, you know, I have another memory of sitting in the crib with my hands in those little uh, fingers in those little things and a pair of, uh, of black legs, very thin black legs and white shoes and a blue uh, seersucker dress, uh, you know, from the, below the knee. Oh, that's and, strange. Uh, and so I asked my mother, is there like, and she said, yes, we had a, you know, we had a, a woman who helped us whose name was Happy and she was Jehovah's Witness. And she was very thin and tall and beautiful. And uh, so that, you know, like these things like come uh, very early memories like that, that I, that I have. Um, yeah. Well, so, and then within this period, what do you recall? So just as young Patrick, what was going on in pop culture that stuck out for you, that fascinated you, that, that inner, you know, that caught your attention? Like cartoons, um, anything? We didn't have a TV. We didn't, we, did, we got a TV when there was a, a moon landing. Uh, so I was older by the time television was introduced to the house. Uh, I would go to friends' houses occasionally and see TV there. Um, so it was that wasn't a big influence. What um, about comic books and stuff like that? I didn't read comic books. I could read uh, sort of the New York Times, you know, picks through words uh, uh, when I was in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And um, but I wasn't a big like comic book or cartoon kid or I didn't um, have those uh, I would you know I, I was taken I'm suddenly thirsty I was taken to theater uh, as a very young child and to um, exposed to things like ballet and uh, um, yeah but I, I didn't. I didn't have normal um, interactions like, uh, oh, let's let's go to, um, you know, let's go, let's sit down and watch Saturday morning cartoons. Okay. Later, you know, later my siblings did, but I I didn't. Okay. It, it, well, and see, this is the stuff that builds a foundation to um, look into the dream life. W okay, so back here at Young Patrick, did you have a dream life? Do you recall having a dream? I always dreamt. I always dreamt. I've always had very lucid dreams where I either know that I'm dreaming while I'm dreaming. And I've also had um, dreams that were very uh, they were based in uh, uh, places where I lived or where my father worked or um, places that, you know, like uh, my, my uh, boyfriend and partner, Jed, uh, in his artist statement, uh, says his dreams are architectural. And, um, you know, I was thinking about that. And in fact, most of my dreams involve architecture and um, of some sort. I, I had a recurring dream of falling uh, in a stairwell, uh, which was where my father's printing, uh, he was a publisher. And so where his printing company, uh, there was a bindery, there was a color separation on the second floor, there was, you know, like on uh, 25th Street. And I used to have a, a dream of a recurring dream of falling through the stairwell of that building for many, many years, all through my childhood into my very early young adult. And, and I would land and wake up. Um, and that, uh, that was replaced with uh, uh, dreams of you know, riding a bicycle, in parking lots, um, uh, uh, you know, by uh, when I don't know how old you are, uh, when you're like in fifth or sixth grade, uh, through 
well, the other one lasted longer than that, Matt, wait. Uh, I guess that was in junior high when I started uh, dreaming about bicycle riding in parking lots. Specific Did parking lots, you know, really specific parking lots that I knew, but it was always in parking lots. When you, when you said uh, earlier that always lucid, so you at a young age were having high lucidity dreams where you knew you were dreaming. Yeah. And so as back in this early phase, what did the dreamscape look like? What was the architecture of it? Did and also the, you know, just the basic details where it was in color or we doing color and black and white. Could you touch taste? Color and smell? black and white. Um I would get uh temperature was a big thing. Like Temperature of uh, oh uh, was a, was something I was always aware of. Uh, I when I was in about third grade, um, I was I was I died in a dream, and it was the only time it's ever happened. And um, you're not supposed to be able to die in dreams. I heard today, um, but I died in this dream, and I remember I like I remembered it. Um, immediately and it was okay it was warm i remember getting warm i was stabbed in this dream and like the stab went through my through my system and and i you know died and i was aware that it was a dream that i was dying but it was um so uh, temperature is often a thing and, and usually and I, and I dream a lot still but usually um you know the temperature in the dream is based upon the temperature of the environment I'm sleeping in. So if I'm cold in a dream, if I, if like, you know, there's some reason in the dream that I'm cold, it's usually because I've kicked the blanket off and I'm freezing, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a definite correlation there. Will you back up and tell us the dream where you died though? If you can remember that all the details. Um, I don't remember a lot of details. I know, um, I, I basically told, I don't, I don't remember a lot of details. I know it happened. I know like what time of year it happened. Um, is it was the beginning of, uh, the summer break from school. Um, I had changed bedrooms in the house where I grew up and, um, uh, I had this, uh, there was I was I was stabbed by um, a, a woman, like a, a young a young lady, a woman, and uh, and it was okay. I was stabbed in the in the chest in the front, uh, but I felt it like in the back somehow, and just I got warm. I got really like like the sensation was that I was drifting away, that I was dead, but I knew I was dreaming. So I don't, you know, and then I woke up and it was like, okay, I died in my dream. And I <laughs> explained it to my mother that I died in my dream and it was okay and I was warm. It, this is fascinating. In uh, Were you experiencing it as first person or omniscient? Like where were you experiencing the dream? I was that I was stabbed. I was I was first person. It was like happening to me. Uh -huh. I was aware that it was happening to me. That it was a dream happening. That I was dreaming, and that I died. And that you know, like okay, that's over. Okay, I can wake up. I'm dead. You know, like I'm dead. I can wake up. Wow, that's that's great. And I, you know, it's it's, it's really not something I've heard a lot of talking about dreams for so long. Uh, and, and you say so you were third grade here too and young. This is, that's a, a rather juicy dream. And the temperature. <laughs> I, I, and I remember, but it's weird. I, I can remember like that, how the type of warm that it was, it was like not, um, I described it as warm, but I think it was like, um, it was almost like uh, becoming one with 
like liquid, like a warm liquid kind of. It was weird. It was, um, but it was it was a totally okay. And I yeah. think I don't fear death because of partially maybe because of that. And also I've seen friends who died, and I think those who fear death have a much uh, have a harder time dying. Yeah, think, definitely. Like, if, you, if you just don't fear it, it's just another part. You just like whatever, you know, time go by. Um, friends who just, you know, deal with it um, seem to, you know, it's, it's a one, two, three, okay, next. You know, yeah. so uh, I, I've, I've never really feared death. Maybe I should more, but I haven't. I don't. I, I don't think it, yeah. you should. And and we both lost so many people. Oh yeah, yeah. That I mean, uh, yeah. I don't think you should. And I love that this came on early in your life too. When so also back here with the architecture of your dreamscape. Were you a flyer in your dreams? Many times. How do you, in, yes. in general, do you have a general way of flying or does it alternate? It alternates and um, um, the, the, the flying is, has always been, it seems, um, purposeful. It's not just, um, you know, a soaring thing. It's like a travel from one part of a building to another or from, you know, I have to get, and, and one part of the building could be like, you know, a city block away. So I, I you know, kind of hop fly to, to a, a, a place that I still dream of is the Anderson Theater. And um, uh, the architecture of it, it was, it was an old Yiddish theater uh, that my dad and his partner, business partner owned and um, was built in 26 uh, by Altar, I think Altar was the architect in Lamb. And um, uh, you know, there, were, there were people, there was, a, there was a murder in the theater, the last row, uh, a, a husband uh, slash the lover of his wife and ran out the side door down 4th Street That, that was such a, a significant place in my early adult life to me and what I did there and who I was living with and what was going on um, and how, how it was sort of, my dad sold it and I had, you know, I wasn't resolved with that. And um, so I think that's why I still less frequently, but I still dream of the end of computer, which is very, Strange. You know, there are places where I uh, have lived or have lived and worked, been involved with. Um, funny enough, I don't dream about any of the properties in Iowa. I never have. And, uh, I don't, you know, like I was there for a long time and I put a lot of effort into those properties and they were sort of, you know, I, uh, but I never, they weren't well resolved from my perspective, uh, the transfer of those properties, but um, they didn't, for some reason, have the same weight as, and I, and even recently, like, you know, a few nights ago, again, I dreamt of the Anderson Theater. Maybe is because it, is the brother, Anderson still standing? Um, no, it's been, it's, it's, it's been built in, it was, it, you know, it was a quarter of a city block. It was quite large. And um, it was on 2nd Avenue and 4th Street. It was about a 1,756 seat theater with a very large chandelier and a big proscenium and three boxes going up on either side of the auditorium. And um, um, it had uh, the sort of uh, canals that ran under the audit auditorium seats. And um, I lived there for a number of years. 
What was your dream? Just so you re just recently had a dream there. Do you mind sharing that? Um, it was um, part of it's uh, part of it's recurring, and uh, part of the you know like uh, there's always um, in the dream there's always uh, uh, you know I'm not supposed to be there. Uh, it's dangerous now. Um, I have stuff stored there still, you know, because as, as I, as many New Yorkers, uh, have two storage facilities, one for my art and one for uh, household possessions and broken chairs. And, um, yes. and, uh, <laughs> and um, you know, books that, uh, you know, sweaters that I've not worn in, you know, 15 years. And um, <laughs> so New York. <laughs> and um, uh, so, you know, in the Anderson Theater, I have this, the, the, I lived um, in the, what was the office and rehearsal space, which was on three floors above the lobby of the theater. And um, which was about, I would say, 70 feet wide or something like that and uh, ran down uh, along 4th Street. Uh, there were, the, it was sort of a T-shaped building. And on the cutout on the left side, on the corner of 2nd and 4th, was a, was a tenement apartment building, which my dad and his partner also owned. And they just wanted me to get an apartment in there. I didn't want an apartment. I wanted the theater. <laughs> so I never had an apartment. and. Um, you know, they, my family still thinks, why didn't you just take the, you know, I never wanted to be part. And on the other side was um, a vacant building, which um, was where uh, we installed a, a bathroom. So I could leave because the Anderson Theater had no running water. Hilly, had, Hilly Crystal, who had CBGBs, uh, broke the water main. And so when he opened the uh, CBGB Second Avenue Punk Palace, the the bathrooms in the basement were flooded and um uh what a dick uh, so when my dad yeah so when my dad got the building you know the, the first thing we wanted to do was put water main a, a new water main well that was two million dollars just to put the water main in you know he got the building for like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something in 1977 i believe and um uh, so, you know, it was like a different economy. Eventually they sold the building, he and his partner. But, um, so I always have these dreams where I have stuff stored there. Um, uh, the ceiling is rotting. Uh, there are new owners who want me not to come in there anymore. Um, you know, all the stuff that sort of happened around when I had to leave the, the theater. And, um, and I sort of relive that because I guess it's not really resolved in my head, although it was perfectly resolved. You know, I cried, but then went to Japan and, so, and they were, we were all living together. And so I was there alone in this like, you know, rat infested vacant theater. And um, uh, so I, I uh, thought, well, I'll open the gallery. Uh, and until then, uh, I'll rent my friend's studio space. So one of the, my friends, Joe, Stewart, she's, an art, she's an artist, and Michael Stewart, who was an artist who was killed by transit cops in 1983. Uh, I rented a studio to, for $25 a month, which he couldn't pay. So I, I got from him in drawings, which I recently loaned to the Guggenheim Museum. And... Um, I love uh, how time circles like that. <laughs> so weird. But like, so the Anderson Theater still uh, plays such a significant part of my professional life, you know, and um, um, I wrote about it and, um, you know, George Kondo, who's a well-known artist, uh, I sold uh, drawings, uh, uh, you know, early paintings of his to Andy and Keith, which uh, 
uh, there was a show at the Guggenheim, this show that, uh, called Defacement, which uh, is about the murder of Michael Stewart and uh, Jean Michel's uh, reaction to that event in a painting which he gave to Keith Haring and it was the basis for this exhibition. And I was the only person who owned Michael Stewart drawings. And at the, after Michael was murdered, I opened the gallery and I sold five of George Condos to Warhol and Keith Haring. And so he writes about that. He writes about the Anderson Theater in his essay for the Guggenheim also, which was kind of a nice surprise for me because I, you know, I didn't even, I didn't know if George would remember that but um, apparently it loomed large to him for whatever reason. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, it's it's little stories like that too. I mean, you're good friends with Keith Haring when he was alive. Like all this stuff's of interest, you know, CBGB's water <laughs> breaks out of your theater. Like all this stuff is so juicy. And I, I love how, uh, how the, this theater has played such a significant role, like a person in your dream life. It's a character in your life and it's it re is. and has constantly like a re there are reoccurring aspects to it and uh Absolutely. and then and then new stuff that gets braided into the dream narrative. Indeed. So, so I th I find that of interest. Have you in your in your life of dreaming so actually let's back up when you're lucid in a dream explain your experience of being aware that you're lucid aware that you're dreaming um there are times when i dream of uh, multiple suns or a sun and a moon that are the same uh value of light uh, but usually it's suns, you know, uh, morning suns, and there would be two or three morning suns. And um, I'm I am just aware, that, not just, but I'm aware that these are dreams that I'm uh, witnessing, as opposed to experiencing in a way. That. Uh, I guess that's the difference, right? That that I that I witness these things, and that I in my brain document that they are uh, that they're not happening anywhere other than in this dream. And uh, so you know, like I don't worry. Uh, I don't. Um, you know, I get anxiety over the Anderson Theater. Like, you know, I'm the the the, the roof is has uh, I can see the sky through, and I think I have to fix that. But no, uh, you know, I know that this is like that. Somehow, is even though I'm aware that these are dreams, I'm more emotionally involved in them. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't. I don't witness them as much as as I experience those Anderson Theater dreams. Do, and so, riding this wave of consciousness within the dream realm, what about out of full on like uh, astral projection or out of body kind of stuff, like bilocation stuff? Any of that for you? Um, not as, not, I can't say that I really, no, I don't really believe that I, um, not that I would recall, I mean, maybe I do, but not that I recall. And I, and I dream a lot. I dream a lot and I talk in my sleep a lot and I, you know, uh, I cry for help often mm -hmm. and I, you know, bolt up. Uh, awake, um, something's happening that I can't stop, and I wake up to prevent me witnessing something happening. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, but I don't really uh, ask to project, and I don't really, ha I can't think of like out of body, real out of body experiences that I can recall. How much control do you, so when you're lucid, how much control do you feel you have when you're dreaming? Sometimes quite a bit. Uh, sometimes I can go back, like I'll wake up for a second, check, okay, yeah, it is a dream indeed. Okay, go back. I've done that. Um, and as to the control of events or how they are going to unfold, in a way that's either dangerous or not, or that, because um, it's always like, you know, what kind of trouble am I in now? <laughs> no, it's not really. Um, <laughs> now what? They're all like now what dreams, you know? Yeah, of course. <laughs> and um, uh, so, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I, 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 sometimes I have a, bit more control over it uh, but I but I think uh, I, I, I think I, I don't really uh, intentionally or purposefully steer events that are occurring to avoid that oh my god now what scenario yeah, <laughs> I just, yeah. you know I run into it I just like you know but I'm aware that I, I, it's just that I'm aware that I'm having this dream. Yeah, and, right. But um, they're playing out. They're playing out. And I have different ways. Uh, you know, I've caught myself like waking up, having different ways of talking to different types, uh, talking in my sleep to different types of dreams, um, which is weird. And, I, and I'm like, who are you doing that? Like, wait, you know, like get, wake up completely and stop that like i'll hear myself in my dream like me 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 like whining or something and uh like you know what are you what you know like one of the first things i remember my father ever saying was no whining <laughs> but but in your dream were you were you like screaming uh no usually if i have to scream in a dream i don't get it out yeah i'm the same way and i've noticed that when I would be like screaming a lot in my dreams, in real life I'd be going me 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 me, me like doing that thing. Yeah, it's yeah. just no, it's weird. But it, but it, but the, but the scream thing, if I if I actually have to scream in a dream, um, it's it's damn near impossible to get out. No, it's it, it's like your voice gets froze. It's like a stage fright or something. Like your voice freezes up and you, nothing comes out. And then I'll wake up because I'm supposed to scream and I can't scream. Yeah. I've As opposed to this yeah. other weird thing, which is like, nya, 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 nya. I don't know what <laughs> it is, but I hear it. I hear myself kind of doing it. And I'm like, oh my God, why is someone, can Jed hear this? You know, like, you know, am I on a bus and I'm doing this on a bus? <laughs> <laughs> Just an app on, on the bus. The bus. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when the last time I was on a bus, but you know. <laughs> I'm sure that blends well in New York City. Actually. On the bus. Know, I, I never, yeah, on the bus. Older New Yorkers take the bus. It's a weird thing. Uh, and, I've, and I learned it with, with my friends that were aging, like, Renee would take a bus. I would see him and he'd like be, you know, at a bus stop. He'd go, I'm taking, I don't want to talk to you. Like, he wouldn't talk to you, but he was getting on a bus and he'd go across town. And, and then he became like less uptight about it. And he liked the bus. And I thought, well, I'm going to try the bus. And so I tried the bus. And then I found out friends my age are also like taking buses in New York. And um, I remember like uh, um, my friend, uh, going from uptown to the mud club downtown and taking the bus. Um, you know, Richard Soule, uh, who played with Patti Smith, used to take the bus to the mud club. Such a genius. And um, uh, so I, 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 don't, I don't fall asleep on buses, though. <laughs> That's a good thing, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't take them often. <laughs> right. So like, well, I have like certain, certain, there are certain things I do on a bus. Like, 
I will, there's a bus uh, that goes, the M15, for instance, it's from Water Street, which is a block away from where I am here. And it goes up First Avenue. And if I have an appointment at Bellevue Hospital or something like that, I will take the M15 up to the city hospital. And um, uh, which is where uh, I got, you know, uh, uh, clean of drugs uh, with my uh, psychopharmacologist, Dr. Anna Tina Misha. And, um, you know, that's a bus route that I take. Renee used to go across town. My friend Lisa Rosen goes up in, you know, downtown buses. So people I know that my age now are, are taking buses, which I think is a riot. I heard that, um, I think it was Laurie Anderson's in the eulogy or something. I heard that Lou, Lou Reed uh, was, was still taking buses late in. Like, I can't remember if it was Lori. I can't remember where I heard that, but I just always found that interesting. You know, because like literally everyone knows who Lou Reed is. So, well, he did have a busload of faith. <laughs> I think we lost Patrick again. <laughs> this is the night of retrogrades and the planets and Patrick's. Patrick's mic. <laughs> so what Laurie Anderson did a, a eulogy of Lou Reed. Yeah, she did a really powerful one. And Patrick is friends with both, of course. And uh Oh Superman. And but it was moving. It moved me. And I I think I've lost Jerry now too. No, I'm here. Oh, it's weird. I just see okay, there we go. Kind of interesting though. We lost you, Patrick. I'm back. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, how long gorgeous. Um, so actually, so I want to ask you in the dream realm again, when do you, now I know we've talked about this in the past, but do you dream true? Do you have uh, premonitions through dreams that maybe you don't, aren't aware that you, they were going to, come to pass but have um i don't know um i can't think of any instances where that's happened in dreams it happens in real life a lot <laughs> but um uh is in like psychic ability as in Um, in oh. hidden culture, hitting uh, years later, and uh, you know, uh, like or you know, artists. Uh, my, my my, I guess the the way I find it uh, occurs most is with artists that I worked with, um, who. I've gone on to have tremendous success, which is a nice thing. And um, that, uh, you know, it's nice that my batting average is pretty, pretty good on, on that front has been. And- uh, Well, especially as an art dealer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it, would, it wouldn't matter. Well, no, but listen, there are art dealers. No, here's the thing. There are art dealers who have no concept of that or precept of that that they uh you know have no intention of inventing artists or of seeing being able to see that this artist at 25 is actually going to be a very important artist 30 years later um and and some of the best art dealers in the world have no interest in that whatsoever and have made tremendous fortunes whereas i have made very little money and have been very correct on many. <laughs> yeah, you have. You you've been. It's um. It's remarkable, Patrick. Really, and, and that's why I said I'm at the beginning of the show. I'm glad that you're getting uh, some recognition for it's, those. It's nice. It's only taken sixty years. I know. <laughs> I know, darling. <laughs> but it, that said, also these were your friends, and um, sure. and so there are personal relationships, which means there's 
more really wonderful behind the scenes stuff that comes with it than just a lot of dealers that just want the in and out experience and um and to help kind of curate what they think people what they want to see out there you you've been in the thick of it and that's what i meant right. but i i want to get on to uh on to your idea so with this riding this wave what about deja vu how do you do you experience it how yeah. do you experience it and are you able to lay down where where that first time came from like when when you're pushing into a deja vu um so basically I, what is it for you um it's it's like a, a something i've i'm here again i'm you know oh wait i know what's going to happen next don't say that if you say that that's going to trigger this and this and this or uh you have to move because if you don't move something will happen you know like i'll i'll see oh dear but as yeah. usual <laughs> uh, yeah but 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 it's just like the it's like uh these relived experiences like i've seen this exact i've been in the same spot before the sun was in the right spot the whole that that flower was dying there it goes again like you know stuff like that and, uh -huh. um i don't know where that comes from but i do you know a few times a year i would say experience not many but a few times a year probably and then also and if you don't want to talk about this kind of thing in in using uh, certain types of substances, has that affected your dream life? I know you, I know now you don't, but in the past, you know, everybody did when we was young, darling. Well, um, some of us did to greater extent than yeah, you know well, somebody who had greater sense. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm like, I, I've talked openly about what I played oh, look, with. I've, yeah, no, I've, I've, I, you know, I've started uh, young, uh, <laughs> uh, taking drugs and smoking cigarettes, and I've paid for both. And uh, I, I found heroin. Uh, I moved into uh, an apartment in the East Village in 1981, I think, or something like that. And um, I was with Robert Hawkins, and. Uh, had this little apartment above a woman who had a lot of cats and very old cat litter. And um, she- uh, A classic and, and cat so, lady. <laughs> and <laughs> so we, we had um, burning incense all the time. And the day we moved into the apartment, just as it's getting juicy i know <laughs> patrick we keep losing you the strangely enough the audio is always there when jerry pulls it so people will have to just play back play oh that back. won't be there i guarantee it oh no oh, what happened you've disappeared you, again during Am I back? yes yeah, you're back you disappeared during when you moved in okay so we moved into this apartment in 1980 or 81 and uh uh, the super opens the apartment door. We go in. We look around the apartment. I, I look in the broiler. I find a, a stack of heroin. And I go, what's this? And Rob goes, it's heroin. Let's do some. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so we do these little, little, little things of like, you know, matchbook head, matchbook uh, sulfur size head of, of this substance. And um, right after we opened the first one, the, the nine bags are in the rubber band and the one bag is open and there's a knock on the door and it's the super. And he goes, oh, hey, it's Hector. I left a piece of glass in the apartment and a broom. And so he you know, goes to the bathroom and he picks up a broom and saunters around and goes down to the broiler. 
and his face falls and his whole body like slumps <laughs> <laughs> and he goes out the door and he walked right past the the cardboard tube with the stack of heroin one bag open on top and and we look at each other and we go okay let's go and so we you know we did it and i got a job which i started that was friday on two on oh how did that work it was like the next day i started a job uh at, at a broadway show uh selling uh, uh shit and clutter for my dad for the show called tin types lynn figpeg was in it she was great and um it was about photographs and old songs and um but i went there the first day of this job hallucinating off heroin and um it, the only time that it really affected a dream was that first time i did it and i was like in a nod state and i actually saw a miniature elephants walking in this you know apartment that smelled like cat litter and cat piss uh and so you know little one inch elephants one inch elephants uh that you know i guess that was the only dream but it was in a you know it was in that uh the nodding nod. yeah yeah, yeah with, that's uh, very interesting imagery actually um I, I didn't really, I never really paid any attention to it, to be honest, only because uh, um, I was so freaked out that I had done heroin. It was the drug my father said, whatever you do, just don't do heroin. So of course, like, let's just start with <laughs> heroin. Start with it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, rebel, rebel. Yeah, it was... Uh, I'm glad that's behind me. Uh, and uh, um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's it's well behind you. Um, well, that that was like one of my questions. It's often a question too: is how um, substances uh, play into the dreamscape if they help or not. If they, um, I guess, augment the dream experience mm -hmm. or or totally just obliterate it. I think with with opioids, and so you know, include they obliterate. It would obliterate because what it did was it eliminated time, right? Opioids eliminate time, and you, uh, you know, you go to sleep. Uh, you, you, your 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 dealer arrives uh, just in time for the view, and you have you know, like so there were no dreams in there. Also, there were no dreams of you know accomplishment. Uh, it was, a, it was a real uh, kill kill. Yeah, but missing the view isn't a bad thing. Um, no, it wasn't a bad thing, and I didn't mind missing that or Oprah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, at the time. so I want to get into because I want to allow a little time uh, for you to talk about your work with Nan Golden, who's you know you were in so many of her photographs and all that, and you're good friends. Uh oh, I think I'm dying. What? Mm. I thought I was losing you. Okay. I thought and I was roboting. No, nope. Okay. Uh, okay. And so I want to talk about uh, some of the stranger stuff in dreams. When do you, how do you experience people that have passed on in dreams? So you, the, your personal. That's day. important. That's yeah. important. That's important. Um, um, uh, uh, they, um, I, I dream of, I, I, it's not like I dream of them. It's more like they visit my dreams, right? That they're, so in fact, they're almost like I get a visitation in the dream from, or in a dream, and it will come or Renee will come, or um, who was it the other day? It was somebody like, who did I dream of last week? It was like about a week ago, there was somebody, uh, another friend, it was Rocky. Um, you know, you get weird, but, but um, um, 
they're all, they're more like visit, they're visiting the dream, like they're coming to help with the dream or um, something more like that. So I do, I do consider those visitations that, you know, I, I got to see Renee or I got to see uh, Jean-Michel hasn't been around in years, uh, but I, I've had dreams with him. Uh, what about um, Cookie? I think you've talked about Cookie Mueller dreams before. I've had Cookie. I've had Cookie dreams. I've had Cookie dreams, and I've had um, uh, I had Way Bandy dreams. I've, I've had Way Bandy dreams, and I've had um, Cookie dreams. You know, Cookie. Uh, uh, was so great and and uh, it was such a part of my daily life for, for so long in a way yeah and, I know um, uh, that um, you know I, 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 I recently dreamt of Cookie and we were in Positano together we at one point went to Vittoria De Sica's house with Rene Ricard and uh, Lindy Oblonsky and Pat Place uh, from the Bush Tetras and the Contortions, and um, Carol Davis, who's an actress, was around. And we, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I was recently like I dreamt of that house, and we had we had a. a an August, it was an August celebration, an August celebration, uh, and uh, Frank Sinatra was there, and um, not in the dream, in, in real life. But, yeah. So, I, so, so I, you know, we, I had this dream of the house, and Cookie was there, and uh, Vittorio, and, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's nice, you know, it's like a nice thing when I get to see friends who are no longer with us. Uh, or any again. when do you have in so with the dead in the dreams have any of them okay so first of all have you dreamt and some of them you know some some people we know are are you know they've got illnesses or whatever and we know they're going to pass some just pass suddenly but have you had any experience with kind of foreshadowing knowing that someone was getting ready to pass or had passed before you found out in person? Um, not really, no. I, you know, I, I think that with myself, my dreams are all having to do with the past. And I, I think that I don't really dream of stuff that's going to happen or that, I, you know, foreshadowing or foreseeing things that that doesn't happen to me in dreams. Dreams really are about, to me, uh, it seems that they have to do with the past. Um, you know, I, recently I dreamed of this situation. Well, I, I, I was like six or seven years old. And I remember I uh, had all these radios and I put them all, I was making a discotheque and I put them all uh, like, around the house and outside. And I took uh, one of my grandfather's silk scarves. And, and I remember my dad like turning off the radios and he, he turned off a radio and it was still music playing. He couldn't figure out where I had stashed all these other radios, you know, and he was angry at me. And I dreamt of that recently of like that, the weather, of, you know, the radios outside and inside and uh, the paisley silk scarf of my grandfather's on a, on a stick. It was weird. Like, oh, I always say, you know, like, where did that come from? And um, there it was. And uh, the radios were just on. My father wasn't there to try to turn them off or anything. So it was, you know, it was different, but it was like that situation. And then I left that and went... Um, you know, traveled into something else. But I remember, like, that was a starting point of a dream recently for some reason. Is there, have there been times when uh, encountering the dead in the dreamscape have been too emotional where it would, 
where it was too hard, maybe it was too close to the death or, you know, Never. like a heavy, no. Im- no, they've always been. No, way. no, they've always been um, really, you know, there as support and as some sort of, you know, I've always been happy to have them. And you, and those are usually, you know, lucid i'm lucid i'm aware that it's a dream and that they're visiting those are pretty loose i'm really aware of if i see edit or i see renee the name too uh i'm i'm uh i'm aware that i'm experiencing something special and that i you know yeah i i I get the same it's the same for me. It always feels special, for sure. And especially when I when I when I realize that they're they're there, and it's not mm-hmm. part of my own unconscious. That they're it's actually you know they're driving their own boat, you know, and I'm driving mine. Right. And it's a it's an interaction. Right. And do you dream of future stuff? Do you do you dream of stuff that's going to happen? Oh, child! Of course I do. Yeah, See, I don't. My stuff's all like past stuff. Mine's all past, and I think that's so I can, you know, I can work towards future. I think I don't know. I I I, I don't think uh, I don't. I really don't dream of future stuff. It's very. Yeah, I, I really, hear it's really specific. We hear, you know, we hear we hear it both ways, and so it's mm-hmm. just everyone's. Every this is the thing I love about talking about dreams is they're really everyone's a little different and i just don't think there are any one one template that fits everyone and so and that's what bothers me in the field and in the research field some of course some researchers are just dynamic and amazing and bring forth the diversity in which people experience dreaming but there are just so many one size it's all people out there talking about dreams that it's it's frustrating i'm wondering now for a little bit of the woo woo uh do you have you encountered scary things in the dreamscape so kind of more like so give give us an example of of scary things um scary thing i I don't it's usually danger it's as as opposed to scary it's some sort of dangerous something that is about to happen i don't really get scared i get, i think when i was young when i was a kid i definitely would have scary you know woo woo dreams uh uh the uh, you know uh, i remember uh like i would have this dream when i was probably in third grade or something and um, I had this high boy in my room, and um, that's a piece in, of furniture in, for people that don't know what that is. <laughs> you're kidding, right? Yeah. No, I, so, I'm telling, I'm just trying. To, I thought it was a might, drink. Somebody might also think it's like a high boy, you know, like. <laughs> no, it's a beautiful piece of furniture. Okay, well, so I had like, a high boy in my. In in, in uh, uh, it was American in American piece of and um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, in my dream, you know, like right, and it was shortly after my grandparents died, I guess. But in my dream, it would become a coffin, and I could not get out of. I couldn't get out of the room. And so I was unable to scream, of course, and, you know, like t- terrified. And, you know, then I could scream for a parent. I had that dream in the beginning. I woke up. And, you know, like, you know, it's a high boy. It's not a coffin. You know, you can get out of the room if you have to go back to sleep. And I would. And, you know, if a week later, and that went on for about, I would say, a year, where that was really a scary. That furniture, that piece of furniture, would always turn into a coffin in my room. And we also had um, a, 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 a bust of my grandmother 
uh, it was like a white metal and uh, by a famous a uh, well-known italian artist and um uh that i scary it would be a scary element in a dream because she was young and beautiful when the thing was made in the you know 1920s and uh uh you know she died an old lady that i was afraid of <laughs> and so then this 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 white ghost bust um was something that terrified me in life but it was also entered into the dreams sometimes at that same period when i was always afraid of it and it was sort of move and you know scream she was mean but you know, she was quite genius but she was quite a mean woman didn't care for me and now i know why <laughs> but um you know i was whatever um <laughs> So yeah, I don't, but now I don't, I think in terms of danger more than scary. Yeah. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, also, what about things that are kind of non-human? So it, it just depending on your perspective, it could be, you know, I guess classified as uh, demonic or ETs, you know, wherever, wherever you sit on that paradigm, but things that are not, uh, really not human and also kind of in the way that we experience the dead, where they're driving their own vehicle, where they feel not like a part of your unconscious, not like a part of you. They feel like something other. Mm. Um, I can't think of you know, instances where uh, they've been so menacing. I know I've had dreams where they're non-human entities. And it's very rare for me. It's not something that happens frequently. Um, but I know I've had them. And I dream differently in different places. Like every place that I've lived that has become home I've had different types of dreams and uh, sort of different, I guess it's because I, you know, every place represents or is a different phase of my life. It has been a different phase of my life. And um, so uh, I, I don't really get that often, uh, but, it, but, 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 but when I, shift and i guess that's part of the you know uh residences or workspace um it always seems to affect what i dream and how uh the architecture of or the sense of place in a dream shifts uh sometimes slightly Sometimes not at all. Like Anderson Theater is always the Anderson Theater. Uh, uh, my father's building on 25th Street is always the same building on 25th Street whenever I dream of it. And Iggy Gross, who was the color separator there in the you know early 70s, um, there are there are things that remain sort of constant, um, and uh, you know I. I, st I, st I still get separation anxiety. I mean, I, now I understand why I have separation anxiety being put in an orphanage uh, for the first year. And um, I think of, uh, of, of how I would, you know, like, uh, like sometimes I get, there was, a, there was an event, uh, I remember, uh, Uh, I guess that we left Fort Lee and, and moved to uh, Far Rockaway, where I had my first friend. And um, uh, I remember uh, my mother leaving in a pink suit and um, uh, being up on this whatever floor it was and with a babysitter. 
and watching my mother leave the building and me, I was, you know, a year and uh, my brother was not yet born. And me, and my brother had to have been born. He must have been born. Uh, uh, but me like standing on my crib and looking out uh, uh, to this like inner, inner courtyard walkway between buildings uh, and, and trying to yodel loud enough so my she didn't really I had such a hissy and such a I, such fear of anxiety <laughs> that I actually passed out crying and, um, <laughs> you know but I didn't I didn't know like you know sitter didn't know why he passed out crying because he was yodeling and the mother didn't hear him yodel and and <laughs> I love the yodeling <laughs> <laughs> so weird. but i but I, that is something that occurs in my dream occasionally like that i see that in my dream that's like, interesting like that, you know like that like tr looking out holding holding on to that like standing in a crib holding on to the windowsill and being able to see you know when she came out of the shadow from the building i think that comes that occasionally comes in the dream which is you know my what mother appears you... in a dream. I'm, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> what, so, Patrick, at this point in, uh, you know, your oh. life, life of dreams, can you hear me? Am I roboting yes. for you? Okay, good. You haven't um, roboted at all. In, at this point in your life of dreaming, what do you think dreams are? This is your opinion. And uh, this is a lot of people want to give, you know, the classic answers that come down, the trickle down from the collective about what dreams are as like an authority. But what what do you feel with all the nuance that happens with experiencing, you know, our dead, our ancestors in them, and knowing that that's a real experience, and then also, you know, the filing system of the day-to-day -day life and working out past stuff. What do you think, though? What what is the function, the greater function of dreams for you? Um, I, 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 I don't really know, and I, you know, sometimes. I've had dreams that are very practical. Um, when I began uh, with my therapist, um, a psychopharmacologist, uh, about you know a week in to you know being clean, and you know she was helping me like understand what I was about to face, and I mean I literally saw this woman every day for two and a half years, uh, and sometimes for several hours a day, <laughs> and uh, which is what it took to get clean and, um, and stay clean. And um, that with the help of Suboxone, uh, uh, which I take one milligram of a day, uh, which is an agonist. But uh, when I began therapy with her, um, I had this dream, which was completely Hansel and Gretel tale, where Anatina was leading me out of a dark forest, right past a murder scene, like dead people, cops, urban murder scene in a forest, literally uh, laying uh, a path for me to follow to safety. And I was really excited. Like, I have to tell you, Anatina, Dr. Misha, um, I had a dream and I told her the dream. And she immediately she said, it mm, doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and I was like, what? It's oh, so, wow. how, how, <laughs> how can it not mean anything? She said, eh, whatever, don't worry about it. Now, Let's get, you know, she just went on to the practical uh, work that we had to do. And so uh, 
which which sort of stymied my you know she comes from five generations of swiss research scientists her great 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 grandfather in, uh, discovered the fiber in the heart uh, that sends the electromagnetic uh, uh, charge that tells which ventricle to open when so they don't all contract at once and, and freeze the blood, the movement of blood through our systems. You know, like that, it's, it's called like the Misha fiber. And um, so, so there, you know, there's, uh, when I think of like, you know, here's a deficiency, uh, autoimmune, autoimmune, uh, 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 autoimmune uh, diseases like uh, lupus uh, in Switzerland, you know, and that she just like in, in, a, in a second managed to write off something that seems so significant and so literal. And maybe it was too literal, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know. So I don't know what the functions that these, these are supposed to serve in my life. But I know that sometimes I um, am very disturbed by them. Sometimes I know I have to uh, pay attention to them. Other times I find them just sort of entertaining, like uh, watching television or a video. And, um, and you know, it's either a good, either it's a good show or, oh God, that again, I've seen this, okay, let's, you know, back to the Anderson Theater, okay, my brother James. And, and actually, James, my brother was hit by a car during the coronavirus thing uh, in the Bronx. And I was unable to visit him. Uh, he had a fractured skull and he's bleeding on the brain, and broken femurs and a cracked rib and all this stuff. Oh and, my God. Um, and, you know, he was in St. Barnabas Hospital for three days. And they wouldn't keep him through the fourth day because the entire hospital had been converted to corona treatment or COVID-19 treatment, except for the wing, the one floor of the wing that he was in. And they just wanted him out of there as soon as he could. And uh, so, you know, I was able, a, not able to visit him. He was in them. So I don't know why we have them, why I have them, or what purpose they really serve, except uh, to me it's more like reminders of, of parts of my life that are um, yet to be resolved or um, that I still need to work on or Sometimes it's rewards like these dreams where I have like, you know, several suns in the sky, always freak me out because I think like oh, those, now that is, if there's, if I do have a, a, foreshadow, a foreshadowing dream, maybe it's that, you know, like, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. But, mm -hmm. um, and that's maybe the scariest of all my dreams, perhaps, because it's really unknown why we, why I have those dreams of several suns in the sky, but they kind of freak me out. Yeah, and, I uh, find those very interesting, by the way. Uh, it, it, and what is that? So what, let's just talk about those for a minute. When, when you have one of those, what, what is the general mood around that theme that goes on? Um, it's always uh, somewhat ominous, and um, although accepted, right? Like it's like okay, we're going, we're we're go, we're okay. Here it is again. Okay, there are three suns today, um, and you know I just.
He's Patrick. Gone. He's gone again. <laughs> oh, just when it gets juicy. Oh, well. You're back. Oh, no. You're back. You disappeared. I'm here. I'm here. Are you there? Okay, good. Here. So we lost you when you said the mood is generally ominous, but it's like a normal in this in the dream space with these three suns or multiple suns in the sky. Right. Um, and and so you know, I, I know that life just sort of goes on with the suns and we were waiting for a crash or a burn or uh, something, but it doesn't really happen. There are just three sons and there's sort of, I'm in a car or I'm in, you know, walking or I'm, uh, you know, just I'm seeing them over the skyline um, and how they, you know, shift light in the dream. Uh, but they don't really, they don't, they don't, um, they, they don't seem, I don't really feel threatened or I don't feel, you know, I'm not afraid during them, although they just seem so abnormal. And yet it's, it's a, it's a new normal. So maybe it's, you know, um, don't say that. <laughs> well, and, but there are, you're not alone. One of the reasons why this intrigued me is that there are others that have this, this type of dream with multiple suns, two or three is what I hear, uh, in the sky. And so I find it most intriguing in, and what, what I'm always after is like overlap with dreams. Uh, and so I find that narrative very intriguing. And everyone calls it everyone that's dreaming about multiple suns in the sky has mentioned that it feels ominous and yet everyone around it within the dreamscape seems to you know, be plus acting about it. in a normal yeah. yeah absolutely it's like what we're supposed to have three suns what's wrong with you yeah. Right, exactly. Like you're the freak that thinks there's one. <laughs> you're the freak that thinks they're real. <laughs> right. So okay, so with that said, what is so this is um this is just hypothesizing and this is kind of the you know fun fun part for me is do you think it's possible that we're dreaming right now, Patrick? No. Could this be a dream? So you absolutely think that there is a line between dreaming and reality? Um, yes, yes. I think reality is, uh, yes, there's definitely, you know, dreams are free. <laughs> well, so we think. <laughs> no, yeah, well, I, I, I mean, that maybe that's the that's the that's the difference right that's the that's what makes them not real they're free everything costs money you can't buy a match I mean, you can't get matches without buying them at this point you know like everything it's just like but is it possible that that's part of the general fuckery of this idea of, and, and maybe it's a little too Buddhist, I don't know, but this Maya, you know, this idea of, <clears throat> pardon me, that life is, that everyone's participating in the idea of this being real and tangible and having gravity and because of that there are certain parameters that drive that home like the idea that you can get stabbed and bleed out and die and you know of course have pain that everything costs money that we all have to play the game and get on the wheel and keep it going that that is is part of what is the trickery here that's part of what makes us think that we're not actually participating in a, a, a mass hallucination of sorts oh god wouldn't that be great if this were just a hallucination if trump weren't real 
<laughs> well, so many know. things weren't real, you know, like because it's like the collective creating the whole thing. So, and 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 with that, you know, nothing creates. You, if it were all just daisies, it would be pleasant. But contrast and struggle are what give a lot of meaning and substance to to us. It gives you your grit. It gives you an idea of. Uh, you're what you are and how you function in a way there's a there's also you know ideas out there from people that suggest that we're all just navigating the afterlife and uh and, you know these are just ideas they're chew, they're juicy to chew on it's fun you know it's um mm-hmm. it's a they're, they're good ponders and um you know, if you allow yourself to let go and kind of push into those as ideas in, uh, in, in your world, it can, I, I find can be kind of mind expanding. Uh, and so it's a matter of what we allow ourselves to believe to, I have found in my life. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, um, I guess my, my, for me, and uh, my reality is always so, um, um, it's always so clear, you know, what, um, uh, what I need to do uh, versus uh, my dream world which um, uh, they're just very different for me. Uh, One affects the other, but I don't know that um, I have the capacity to meld the two or disintegrate the barriers between the two. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, it's, sort of- it's a veil of sorts that separates. Because if you think about it, dreams, like memories, are kind of very much intangible. I mean, we, we can tell ourselves we have proof of this or that. And um, and dreams are kind of the same. They're, they're wispy and inta- intangible, except for the stuff that really sticks out, it sticks out hard. And, you know, a lot of times that's tied into significance, even if the 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 stuff is mundane this the material that makes up the memory or the dream is mundane the feeling can the intensity Mm -hmm. of the feeling remains and keeps those images uh ever vigilant right Mm -hmm. so it's it's just interesting to discern you know how did we get you know how did that little little boy putting his fingers through the mesh you know, turn into the man that we're speaking with tonight. There's a, you know, there's this idea of time and how we move through it and the passage of it. And then there's always our, and I always call death the ever present friend because I feel like I know more dead people at this point, you know, <laughs> like than I do alive. And uh, I mean, so many of our friends are dead. And, and so, it's just an interesting thought. And I like the idea of coming from, say, like the Egyptian Book of the Dead and how one navigates through mm. all of it to get to, to, to transcend, you know, at some point. And um, there's a lot of great literature around this idea as well. And so it's always just interesting to put your chops into that i think it's a powerful exercise of nothing else psychologically i mean it, it, you know it makes me think of or uh who exactly uh where i was going with it but um the the, the egyptian book of the dead I, the, the only thing i remember from you know scanning it like uh uh and, and learning from it was that, and, I, and at the time I was really young, so maybe this, uh, but I, I remember um, the Egyptian, like 
when one masturbated, uh, they would mourn the wasted seed. Yes, <laughs> yes. You know, stuff like that. It's and, an and incredible. You know, like, how, you know, that's powerful, you know. Like, uh, Almost Crowley-esque. Yeah, it's it's deeply significant when you actually think about that, especially in in terms of those papyrus, which are actually named going you know going forth by day, but uh, and but it, how significant that is to have made it into the sacred text that the the priest prepared for the pharaoh, which is how that all started anyway, to to navigate that something like that had such importance. And then, of course, it gets twisted. At this point, though, we're getting on in this. And so I wanted to give a little time to one of the things you're passionate about, and it ties into all this. And it's your work with Nan Golden. And if people don't know who Nan is, they can look her up. She's fantastic. Love Nan. And uh, you know, very significant in the world. <laughs> Again, like with with so many people that don't realize how significant some of these artists are that they may not know their names but you and Aunt, uh, nan so nan's forerunner of this but pain so tell us about about this and one of the things that i find interesting is i was listening to an interview many years ago with stevie nicks when she got off of um clonopin is that it i'm here clonopin hi Wow. Yes. Oh, so we're talking about your work with Payne, Patrick. Hi, yes. And so I was listening to an interview with Stevie Nicks several years ago, and she was saying that when she went through rehab to get off of cocaine and all that, and the doctor put her on Klonopin, that it was the worst. It was absolutely destroyed her. She said she didn't, she lost a decade of her life. And yeah. um, it the was- though, right? Yeah, and it was so hard to get off of, and it was prescribed, and she had such, um, you know, she's spoken out about this very heavily, and then now Nan is uh, for running this pain campaign that you're part of, because you're old mm -hmm. good friends with Nan Golden, and uh, right. and that ties into stuff we were talking about earlier, so as we start to wrap this interview up a bit give us an idea of your work with pain and uh so people can you know find it and understand what it is about and all that okay so um i was contacted by a uh, man and noemi bonazzi who uh worked with me at my second gallery um and i've known forever and um uh, that oh no <laughs> that's <laughs> audio tonight <laughs> oh my god it's crazy Paging Patrick Fox, come to yeah. the. Okay. <laughs> it's it's come crazy. To the front desk. <laughs> come to the front desk. Yeah, go uh, try to be closer to your monitor or something. I don't know. Okay. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on it. I mean, I'm, I'm touching it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, 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 so Nan had this idea, and I thought it was crazy when I first heard it. I thought, that's career aside, what is she insane? Well, of course, not career side. And you know, you have to trust artists because they know what they're doing, for the most part, unless they're not playing the game, right? Then, they, then you have to like try to intercede and get them to actually become their own advocate. But Nan, um, whom I've known forever, we do drugs together. We have lost friends together. All uh, those photos were not. None of those were staged. That's all I'm going to say. None of, them, none of them <laughs> That's were all real. And. Nan and I reconnected uh, at David Armstrong's funeral, or memorial rather. And uh, uh, David Armstrong uh, and I, I drove David 
to uh, Renee's interment in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And um, uh, uh, we talked about getting clean and about Dr. Misher and he asked about Nan. And so it was one of the last things that I talked about with David, who's a magnificent, who was a magnificent photographer, was also a guy. Um, and so when our friend Glenn O'Brien died, uh, I Aging Patrick. For those that may not know too, they Nan Golden's taught in college photography classes. Like she's, you know, she got to that level. Patrick, where are you? <laughs> this audio. Oh Lord. Jerry, this is uh, it sucks. <clears throat> It's well, someone's watching Netflix in his apartment. Nan, uh, Nan, uh, okay, good. Uh, you're back. Yes. Nan, Nan um, you know, was sort of like a, a, a uh, she made this book, she did a slideshow called The Ballad of Sexual Dependency. And um, uh, it's like a, a, a high school yearbook of friends, uh, you know, over about a, a ten-year period, say, and uh, uh, Terry, my ex-wife, and I are in it. I swear not to mention her in this, but you know, uh, and lots and lots of friends, Renee and Cookie, and many friends. David uh, are in it, and um, it's been it's it's had a major influence on photography, and she's considered one of the greatest photographers of our time, and. Um, and she's a dear friend. Patrick, uh, there you are. To, to, demand that, to, yeah, to demand that museums not accept money from drug overdoses because the Purdue Pharma, which the Sackler family owns, um, uh, produced oxycotton, oxycodone, and So I'm going to fill in the gaps until he comes back. Art, major art museums have been taking money from these big pharma companies, y'all. And, uh, and so for someone at NAN's level to stand up and say, who's been affected by opiates and all this stuff prescribed, you know, people from Stevie Nicks to just your housewife down the corner. Down the I mean. World. Thank you, Patrick, you're back. I was kind of filling it in because you popped out again. And again, you're out. Mm, 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 mm. Hello, hello. Oh, it's terrible. So major museums have been taking this basically blood money from big pharma and- uh, And specifically the Sacklers. And yes. uh, you know, the, the, the Guggenheim, uh, it was interesting because I was writing my essay for the Guggenheim at the same time we were planning this major demonstration at the Guggenheim. And so I was going to meet with the curator and talk with curators in the, in the offices, meanwhile knowing like in two weeks we were going to bombard them with uh, these uh, banners and you know uh, every person in the museum actually participating and becoming part of this direct action against their accepting money from the Sacklers, and we demanded that they stop, which they have, uh, uh, accepting, and um, uh, they haven't taken down the Sackler name from the education wing, but uh, so we're still, uh, you know, have demands on, but we've been very successful. We've uh, uh, protested at uh, the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art was our first one at And people, as Patrick, until he comes back, you can look it up, pain. It's all caps with periods in between. And uh, you can see how far along they've gone. And, it, you know, like Patrick said earlier, it's like career suicide for an artist to come up against these major galleries of which Nan is, her art's in. And so 
uh, it, it's extremely bold and brave and could cut off your, uh, your income stream, if nothing else. So, and it also, for all my woo-woo people, this is how, this is where the pharmacies are, are everywhere. Yeah, you're back, you're back now. All right. So we've, we've had, we've had some great successes. We've uh, made direct actions at the Metropolitan, the Guggenheim, uh, Harvard Medical School, the Smithsonian, uh, Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the uh, Louvre, uh, the Louvre uh, has actually taken down the Sackler name. Uh, the Serpentine Gallery in, in London has taken down the Sackler name. Uh, the uh, uh, National Portrait Gallery in London also stopped accepting Sackler money. So we've had tremendous impact and have kept this in the news and the, while you know other things are happening and kept this. Uh, at one point, we talked to one of the lawyers who worked on uh, the tobacco uh, settlement and uh, uh, he said that we have saved the government tens of millions of dollars with our direct action and keeping uh, this in the news. And um, uh, uh, people have to know that by June 31st, uh, they can, uh, if you've been impacted, uh, Oh dear, Patrick. We'll have the link though. It'll be in the show notes. And um and I highly encourage you all to look to look at the idea of where pharmaceuticals are. Is we know they're everywhere, but they're also in the art galleries and they're also they're controlling every narrative. So to to for artists to come together and start tearing this down is a good thing. These are little, little wins, little battles. And so, you know, just, just for the woo woo people out there, it's fantastic. Also, um, you know, dive into the work of Nan Golden. It's absolutely fantastic. There's a reason why she, you know, achieved what she did. Uh, and you can get the gravity of how bold of a move this was. It was, it was a bold move, and uh, the demonstrations have all been really beautiful and artistic, and um, uh, people have until June 31st to uh, file a claim against the Sacklers and Purdue Pharma, uh, um, and uh, there's a link if you go to the uh, uh, Sackler Payne uh, uh, website uh, or... Uh, uh, there's another organization, um, uh, but go to the Sackler Payne website or Instagram page, and there's lots of information of where to uh, and how to apply for money if you've been impacted uh, by uh, the opioid crisis. If you've lost somebody, if you've suffered yourself, there's money. And uh, because the Sacklers have declared bankruptcy, uh, there's a time frame of urgency. So we're trying to get people to get out there and actually apply for the money. Uh, and uh, if you've suffered, you deserve it. Yeah, absolutely. You re you know, re remunerated for it, so. Is there anything else, Patrick, as we wrap here that you would like to promote? And anything you want in the show notes, we'll put in there. So we'll put the pain stuff. If Just get Jerry okay. the link, please. Okay, um, I will. And also, uh, let's see, I have a painting that's opening <laughs> Uh, it was supposed to open in April at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Uh, it's a show called Writing the Future. It's a beautiful uh, show about uh, graffiti, uh, actually post-graffiti, which was when uh, graffiti came from outside of buildings and outside of subways and was made to hang indoor. Differential was uh, largely defined by Edit Dayak, uh, with whom I'm uh, still working, even though she's been dead uh, for several years, <laughs> and she's largely taken over a large part of my life. Uh, and and with give, the us, films, with the give films us those links, on. please. I will. And uh, uh, but that's going to be a beautiful show. It's, it's going from Boston and 
Museum of Fine Arts in Boston to the Perez Museum in Miami sometime next year. And uh, both those are beautiful shows. And if you get a chance, if MoMA reopens, uh, I have a film and uh, uh, edits film that I've co-directed and co-edited with her um, uh, in a, an exhibition called um, uh, Private Lives, Public Spaces. Uh, and it's about home movies. Uh, and I'll get you the link to that because there's wonderful uh, opportunities for viewing uh, uh, that you can actually uh, look at for free. And so I'll get you all those links. My movie's not there yet, but it may be in the next round of films that they release from MoMA. So Excellent. But if, but when the MoMA, if MoMA reopens before October, uh, yeah. my, my film will be still running. Okay, excellent. I thank you, Patrick. So, you know, I just adore you. I love you, love you, love you forever. I love you, love you too. And I thank you so much for spending this time. I know that you don't do these things often, and it's just. Uh, it was a it's, pleasure. I, I thank really you. Was. Yeah, and. Really um, Painless. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So uh, on that, Jerry, I love we'll... you, and I love you, and Jerry. It's been a pleasure meeting you, and thank you. Nice meeting you too, sir. And uh, and uh, stay safe, stay strong, and stay in. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then on that, Jerry, we'll wrap up this live section, and we'll say goodbye behind the scenes. Yeah. <clears throat> this is. Excuse me. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Nish. Be sure to tune in next week. We've got an obelisk for the it's a new moon next week, I believe. And we're going to spend the evening with Joshua Kutchin and talk about his new book, Where the Footprints End. Oh, so, that's going to be exciting. I can't wait. And I'm going to try, try and get... Uh, I'd love to try and get Jessica Morocco in to talk about her channeling the Bigfoot Collective. Yes, we got to get her book done. <laughs> well, I want to get her and Josh together so they can riff mm -hmm. off of each other, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's a whole other thing. Anyway, thanks everyone so much. We will talk to you next week. Have a great night.